you're very welcome to another episode of History Now. Joining me today from Scotland is renowned singer and songwriter, Eddie Reader. Eddie is here today to tell us the fascinating story of her great uncle, Seamus Reader, who was active in the Irish War of Independence in Scotland and then later in Ireland. It's a fascinating topic and I'm really, really delighted that Eddie could join us today to speak about it. Eddie, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm delighted you could join me. This is a story I came across a couple of years ago when it started to appear in the Irish and Scottish press about your, your great uncle. Can you tell us a bit where this, who he was and where this story began? My grandfather's stepbrother, uh, James Reader, <clears throat> had um, very murky for me because I was only about five or six when I started to hear his name in the house. And um, he was never really mentioned except in kind of covert, they're still looking for him kind of <laughs> language. And I, I, I knew there was something about Ireland because his son, Glaswegian-born uh, James Jr., was living in Dublin. And every time we hit Dublin, we went to see James and Molly in their little rose-covered terraced house in Dublin. And um, James, I got a call when they, when they were in the care home saying that all the stuff was going in a skip. And I got there with actually Shay Healy. I don't know if you know Shay Healy, the uh, great TV personality in Ireland. He, he and I had become friends through music. Had come to, he had come to some of my shows. And I said, I've got all this stuff from this old uncle that's something to do with the war. I don't know what war. Would you come with me? So Shay Healy came with me to the house. And in about 50 Centra bags, were full of files and items and um, we opened one of the folders and the first thing we read, me and Shay, was um, I got in the Jarvie at the station and I told them to take me to Wellington uh, Road where I found James Tobin and I put him on his orders and he took me to James Connolly where I unloaded the stuff I, I I was kind of what is all this about? What first of all, what's a Jarvie? James Connolly I'd heard of. Why is my uncle involved with it? So that led to me taking all the things home and finding photographs and stories of of Scotland, circa nineteen hundred. He had written it in diary form, and so I, that was the beginning. I I found some pictures of what I thought was my great grandfather and great-grandmothers and great-uncles and I just, I, I kind of fell in love with this young boy who told me his story in very detailed form and he had collected everything. So it was really, it was a lot, you know, my whole living room, this room in here was just packed with boxes and bags and a lot of the information he got about the, the pre his own time was from the IRB in Scotland some of the head Hegeans there had given him information about the history of revolutionary movements in Scotland from the Union to his birth. And then when it got to his birth, there was a detailed diary of events, you know, January 1912, you know, a Wednesday. It was raining. <laughs> you get all that. And... and um, what was attracting me most of all was all the musical instruments because he was one of the only people in my family that had a musical inclination, you know, and I, and I was bizarrely attracted to finding out more about that, but also selfishly, I wanted to know where my own musical um, background came from. And, and he told me so much, told me so much. Can you tell us a little bit about his background and, you know, where he grew up and, and you know what he was into, apart, apart from the music? Well, uh, James uh, was James Reader and born in 1898 in Glasgow. His father and mother, Catherine Lindsay and Charles Reader, my great-grandfather, uh, who was in the British Army fighting in the African War, the Boer War, he came back and started agitating with John McLean to stop war in South Africa. He also started, him and his, his wife were very much Irish, Irish sympathisers and they lived in the Garangad, which was a very poor area of Glasgow and it was surrounded by um, Irish immigrants from the famine times. 
um, and maybe second generation children were James's playmates. When his mother died, his father married a woman called Elizabeth Brennan from Lurgan, and she went on to have my grandfather, um, Daniel. And Elizabeth Brennan, he, t he talks about how he got some uh, rebel songs from Elizabeth Brennan. He heard a lot of Irish stories from Elizabeth Brennan. But his uh, nature was more attracted to military scouting and the baden Pell Scouts had their first movement in Glasgow and so he joined that and quickly became captain. And uh, his friends, being of Irish extraction, were all a bit scathing of the British military kind of feed that was the British baden Pell Scouts. And they encouraged him to join the Irish Scouts because the Irish Scouts in Glasgow were more focused on Celtic background, mythology, story, song, which was key for him, song and music. So he learned the bagpipes, he learned the harp, he learned the fiddle. When he joined the Irish Fianna, he then was more connected to his own Scottish mythology and background than he was when he was in the British military, militaristic baden Pearl Scouts. So he became very much at home in the Irish Scouts, even though he had no Irish background and his mother and father were, uh, brought him into an Episcopalian background. So he was, he was a, a young boy who was born at the time when changes were happen, or happening politically around him, especially amongst the working class in, or the working poor in Scotland and his father being very heavily involved in um, John McLean and agitating for better wages and helping the unemployed poor. Uh, there was no dole then. So, And his grandfather, my great-grandfather, Jake Reader, would hold workshops in the Gall Gallagate. He had workshops uh, for the steel industry and the iron industry, but at night time he would encourage many men and women from Scotland to come to meetings about Scottish independence. So this is a long-term uh, story, and it's very in, it's very detailed. But what I'm getting a sense of is a young boy who was encouraged to believe in fairness and equality, and who became um, completely enamoured by the the scouting life. Um, especially the Irish Scouts, because one difference that I noticed with the Irish Scouts, the Fianna it was called, the Fianna, um, I had to learn all these names, but Countess Markovic, I had no clue who this person was, and she's written about in his writings because he had a personal relationship with her as a young boy. And um, But what I found out about the Irish Scouts was they came from the Andrew Seton uh, theory of scouting, which was much more inclined to the indigenous Americans, the way they uh, survived in the wild, how they caught um, food, how they set up their tents, how they created environments out in the wild. And that was what the Irish Fianna followed more than the much more militaristic kind of uh, soldiery feed way, which would be the state run um, scouting movements. So he graduates from that scouting background and becomes more involved in Scotland in you know, what we now term the Irish Revolutionary Period. Can you tell us a bit about that and did that lead to his you know, becoming known to the authorities and, and, uh, and prison? Definitely. Um, the way he describes it, and it's partly to do with the conditioning of Scots, especially Glaswegians, in that since the Union there's been a lot of um, secretive and um, revolutionary societies that honeycombed this place. The, this place has an underground history of revolution that is not in the books. You can't find it because it was all secret and a lot of people went to their grave with the oaths of secrecy. My uncles kind of informed me about that and when he was born into a society that was also agitating for fairness, for more democracy, what he noticed was that there was a call out at the Dublin lockout, which was in 1913, 
when he was 15 years old. By this time, he's captain of a Fianna troop. He's very proud to be that. They go camping in Blantyre and Bailiston and all the environs of Scotland. But um, there's a call out from Countess Markovic, who is the president of the Fianna in general, and they get notice that she wants funds for the poor of the lockout, those affected, the poor affected by the lockout. So they have saved 13 shillings and 10 pennies, I think, something like that, approximately, for their first international camp, which was to be in Dublin, or the outskirts of Dublin, when they decided to half it and take nine pounds over on the boat with Seamus, now called Seamus, because he's taken on the Irish form of his name. He's decided he's now Seamus, and he's, he's wanting to take this money as representative of all the Scottish Fianna Irish Scouts, and he's going to deliver it personally to Countess Markovic. So he goes on the boat himself in his Fianna uniform as a 15-year-old boy, and he gets to the other side and he finds his way from the North Wall in Dublin to Liberty Hall, where he meets Countess Markovic, Helen Mooney, all those women that were involved in the suffragette uh, Kumanaman. And he meets A.E. George Russell, who compliments him on his uniform and says, you must be a fine Fianna warrior. And he doesn't really know about the Fianna mythology and George tells him all about it, tells him about the colours of the uniform, why they are that colour, what they represent, the stories, the mythological Ulster cycle, you know, Deirdre of the Sorrows, the whole shebang. He gets everything from these people in the week that he's there. They knit him a hat. They, uh, they take him around Dublin to see the poor of Dublin and how the, it's affected. They fall in love with him. He falls in love with Countess Markovic and her little puppy dog, Poppy Angel Face. He becomes Countess Markovic's beautiful soldier from Scotland. And he, the first message he was asked to do was to go back to Scotland and to ask the children to provide broken chanters and broken instruments so that they could all have them and start the Finton Lawler flute band. And this was the first message that uh, Seamus went on for the, uh, the, the, head, the head people in Ireland. Um, he slept in her house in Rathmines. He heard them talking about various things and all through, from the age of 15 through to 17, he was going back and forth. And he realized that some of the messages he was carrying was a call to arms to all the Irish in Scotland. So him and his scouts would be sent with messages to a certain man in, in Carmyle or in Deniston or in other places as far away as Edinburgh. And they would go and they would deliver these messages and come back. They would brush up the scout hall and put the tablecloths ready for the tea, for the meetings that John McLean would be having, that socialists would be having, that the Cumann Naman would be having, that the suffragettes would be having, that the Irish IRB would be having, and that was key. They noticed him, and the Irish, there was a guy called Den Dennis Canning, I think he said he was a, a 67 man, which I think is to do with another... Uprising, yeah. Uprising in Ireland. And he was in Glasgow brushing the hall, the Sinn Féin hall in London Road near the East End. And he asked him if, at the age of 17, he was a bit young yet, but would he be interested in joining the IRB and uh, the Irish Volunteers? At that point, he went against his father, who said, I'm OK with you being in the Irish Scouts, but I'm not OK with you getting involved in any of their political uprisings or their aggression. He was worried about him, obviously. So he went behind his father's back at that point. And then... Um, so from the age of 17 to 18, he was working profusely over, back and forward, between James Connolly. Sean McDermott was one of the people that he contacted, and he would provide letters to John McLean, asking the miners to provide detonators in the build-up to the rising. Um, 
Seamus was well aware that that's what was being asked. Fuse wire, raids on old collieries. These were all organised by Seamus. And um, he felt it was his duty to help. Miners would put detonators in their empty lunch boxes. They would be delivered to a shipyard. Uh, Seamus would get a pass to the shipyard and um, would be um, in, in disguise as a an 11 year old scout because he looked tiny he was just a five foot two inch man and he looked like a boy and he um, he formed bands he made Kayleys he raised funds it continued until the January 1916 the year of the rising uh, on the December 15 he went over on the boat and he was arrested so he was arrested in January 16 he had met James Connolly and Sean McDermott and James Connolly had told him that he was a good Scottish lad and that the rising, there was going to be something happening to be prepared, to gather as many as possible and to know that um, it was going to be done along good Scots lines and not on a Sunday. That was the last thing he, he, he was told by James Connolly. When he, when he landed, he was arrested in Scotland. So you've told us there's a lot of really, really detailed, um, you know, artefacts, as diaries, things like mm -hmm. that. What, what are the challenges of, you know, because you're, you're going through them, what are the challenges that you've come across, you know, in, because you're transcribing them, uh, in making sense of a lot of this stuff? I think... For me, the challenge is that I'm not a historian and I'm, I'm just interested in the mm. history. And also, I didn't know what people did or didn't know in his writing. I, all I knew, it was a personal take on being alive at that time, but also being actively involved in, in people that I'm seeing statues to in St Stephen's mm. Green, you know. It, it revealed itself as being a surprising story because I realised that there was a kind of a subtle take on history that I wasn't fed as a child. And I'm sure many of my generation in the whole of the UK aren't, aren't aware of it. The, the idea that there are bad guys and good guys, you know, that that all got demolished pretty quickly. And also, I didn't know who Michael Collins was. I didn't know who Eamon de Valera was. I couldn't even pronounce Markovic, I had to go and find people that knew about this stuff and luckily there were some people around that, that were going, eh, this is important, yeah. there's only one of these in existence and it's lying under your coffee cup on the table, you know what I mean? It was kind of, oh, okay. Yeah. Back in 2015, you know, in the, in the lead up to the centenary of, of the 1916 Rising, you got to bring some of the artefacts to, you know, one of the committees that were talking about holding centenary. So how, how did that feel to get all of that on display at that? Because I've, I've looked at, at photographs of it. Yeah, we did it in Glasgow's Mitchell Library as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had old men coming up to me. See, me, I'm an emotional girl. I'm, I'm not an academic. I never was. I'm a dreamer and a painter and a singer. And um, what I notice about this story is the humanity in it. And the and the the love in it and the and the struggles with trying to find love in it and when we did the exhibition a lot of older people come up came up to me and said are you allowed to actually tell people about this an old man he must have been in his nineties said my father was in the British Army and he's from Dublin you know and. I could tell that he'd lived a life of prejudice and sectarianism and I've only had a flavour of it, not that I've paid any attention because I don't believe it's worth my attention, but I, I do know it's there and I've noticed that just by finding this stuff has created um, a lot of anger towards me in many areas of Twitter and, mm. you know, I should burn it all, yeah. which is very... Interesting. Mm. I mean, I always think that if you want a child to grow, the child needs to have the whole palette of information, 
all the languages, the Ulster Scots, the Gaelic, everything. It has to have it all so that it can regurgitate it as new things and new creativity and advancement. But if you block a child from it, then you're, you're blocking your own humanity, I think. Yeah. There's a really interesting, and, and you stepping aside from you know the, the the political stuff. Well, you know you know the Irish political stuff at the minute. Your your, your great uncle collected lots of songs. Yeah. Uh, has any of that uh, made it into your songwriting? Absolutely. Um, one was Deirdre of the Sorrows, which I didn't know was Deirdre of the Sorrows, but it was a song called um, Deirdre's Farewell to Scotland, and that was that piqued my interest because it's about Scotland. And I put it on Cavalier, the last album I made. It's just me and um, Steve Hamilton on piano. And I picked out the melody that was written in the little aged parchment that Seamus had collected. I found that the melody was so haunting. I had no idea it was about Ulster myth cycle. I had no idea what the story was. I only knew this woman had come from and es- was escaping from somewhere and was going to Argyll and was hiding there with her lover. And the lover was being chased by the King of Ireland. That's all I knew. And it was John Spillane who then sat me down and said, this is the story of Deirdre of the Sorrows, which is kind of like a Snow White story. And I'm incredibly fascinated by what human beings invent in their head as far as how they get it, where they get it from, the strands of it. It's like finding gold in a junk shop. You know, you, you just, you get, you unearth this stuff. And I felt that when I was singing it, I was singing about my land, but I was belonging to another land and thanking this land for for bringing me safety for at least a short time. And I, And at the same time, I was watching the news where refugees were being washed up on the shore and I felt very, very much connected to that song and doing it. And that was, uncle, that was direct from my Uncle Seamus. So with all of the artefacts, the diaries, things like that, there, what, are, are you planning on you know, writing these, producing a book on them or anything like that? I would like to. I'm getting it into a state. I want to just make sure there's a, there's a, a revolutionary summary of why it led to the point that he was born. I also want to try and talk about my discovery of it in the light of being born when Scotland is asking itself about independence, which was kind of the same question a hundred years ago for Ireland. Yeah. And the Scots, it wasn't a big enough movement for the Scots to to go for it. Only with the with the dawning of World War Two did the Scots start to assert themselves and and create um, official political bodies um, with people like Wendy Wood, Ronald McDonald, and and other other folk that that Seamus observed. And they were asking the Irish if they could help them in return after Scotland had helped Ireland. And the resounding answer was no. Of course it was. Dan Breen was friends with my uncle Seamus and he was asked to go by the Scots to just try and encourage a Scottish connection. Um, But the answer was no, for very good reasons. You know, they had a deal with England at that point. 1934 in in Scotland, it was a very dangerous place to be uh, someone who was looking for democracy and possible republicanism and possible uh, uh, removal of the Union. It was dangerous for Seamus and he was shot at in Glasgow Green. And at that point, he decided to bite the bullet and leave, bite the bullet and leave uh, leave behind his beloved Scotland. Yeah. And he missed it all his life. He lived in Dublin all his life, but he missed it. And he went to work in the, in the Dal. And he was then useful to do pension applications and try and verify people. And it was, it's so sad when I read through all that stuff because he's, he's kept it all. And there's a man in 1950 looking for a boy that disappeared in 1922. And he's written, killed by the Free State Army. And then there's another brother looking for a son, uh, another boy that was killed. And he's written, killed by the anti you know, the treatists and the anti-treat. So both had 
just when the civil war happened, it was so confusing for people over here that were part of the revolution. One of the wonderful things about in, in the musical thing as well is that what I brought home from Ireland was a harp, um, a harmonium, a piano, five violins, one's very expensive, and I'm trying to learn it, and um, mandolin, <coughs> sheet music upon sheet music. But also, I discovered in his papers that my great-grandfather, his father, who, by the way, died when he was in prison in 1916. He was taken, arrested, put in Reading Jail. Put Edinburgh Castle first, Duke Street, Edinburgh Castle, then Reading Jail as a political prisoner. Um, he was taken there, and um, his father died unexpectedly, and the governor had asked if he wanted to contact some of his family, and he said, no, my family probably have disowned me by now. So he kind of had resigned himself to sleeping on the floor of the scout hall and really living his own life at that point and never contacting the family again. And I think that's why when I was a little girl, I didn't hear too many stories about him. I think his brother, my grandfather, was only nine when this trouble was happening, when soldiers and policemen were raiding her tenement house in Glasgow and bayoneting the, bed, the bunk beds looking for Seamus. So all during that time there was trouble. And, um, and I think um, what I found out about my, my great-grandfather, who died at 36, was that he was a, a, a singer and he loved to sing Robert Burns songs, which really thrilled me. That, so I didn't feel that it was just Seamus talking to me. I felt that it was my ancestry and... Yeah, it was it was a remarkable find for me. And nobody in my family is interested except me. But uh, it's kind of, it's. I'm hoping that the rest of Scotland will be interested, especially in their revolutionary history. You know, it's like I couldn't give it to the Irish really fully in in full heart mm. because it's a Scottish story, and I couldn't give it to the Scots because it's an Irish story. So I'm trying to figure out a way of of playing it so that both communities find out how connected they were yeah. at that time. I just want to show you him. So here he is at age 10, Irish Fianna. And also, then when he was 16, I mean, when he was 18 in 1916, this is his case from Reading Jail. And in it... <laughs> It's unbelievable. This is his cup, which he stole from Reading Jail. <laughs> and the chess set that he stole from Reading Jail. And the books that he stole from Reading Jail. That pride of place is his personal drawing by Countess Markovich of him in the Fianna. Wow. Wow. That's qu quite a collection there, just, and I'm sure that's just a small piece of it. Addy, thanks again. It's it's a fascinating uh, topic. I'm looking forward to seeing you know what else you you're um, going to bring to this story. Well, I have real ambition for it. My intention is that Spielberg gets it and turns <laughs> it into a movie because it's a young, beautiful boy that just grew up with an idea that everything should be fair, and he worked to that end all the time. You know, that's that's all he was concerned about was being a good scout, and at the end of his life. In Dublin Harbour, he was coaching young women in sea scoutry. So he, uh, he was way ahead of his time. He was a, a theosophy student and um, he believed in yogic practices and Middle Eastern philosophies. So he was, and he was a Rosicrucian at the end. So he was very much involved in liberty for, for the common man and woman. Thanks very much, Eddie. You're welcome.